Okay, I think we'll start. Uh, can you confirm that you can hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, yes, thank you. Yes, okay, thank you very much. Thank yes, you very sorry. much. Okay, thank you very yes. much. So uh, welcome all of you to the Radio Astronomy Winter School uh, of 2020. This is being held online for the first time and uh, it's a difficult time for all of us, but we will continue to do our best uh, so that your learning experiences are enhanced during this uh, period. So my job is basically to give you an overview of the universe uh, as observed at radio wavelengths. And many of my colleagues will take you to greater detail and not only in the theoretical aspects of it, but largely also on the experimental aspects of it. So I'll just try and give you a brief overview. And I started the first slide which is a radio image of the sky, which was made uh, by combining data from telescopes in both the Northern and the Southern Hemisphere. Because to see the entire sky, you need to be able to go uh, to, the north, uh, to, to, to the North as well as the South. This was done by uh, Glenn Haslam and his collaborators using telescopes in England, the Jodl Bank uh, Telescope, which is now known as the Lovell Telescope. And, uh, the Bond telescope and the and one at Parks. And this had an angular resolution, this particular image of about 0 0.85 degrees or so. And it was made at a frequency of 408 megahertz. And this is a false color image because at radio wavelengths, you can't really make out color. Color is a perception which is related to our eye. And this is a coordinate system where the equator which you see is the galactic equator uh, my arrow will point towards the uh, center. This is the galactic center. And these are the, which you can see faint blobs over here. These are the large Magellanic clouds and the small Magellanic clouds. Uh, galaxies, irregular galaxies, uh, which are close to us and part of the local group of galaxies. And this is Centaurus A. We'll meet Centaurus A later, perhaps not today, but when I speak to you about active galaxies, then there is a supernova remnant Cassiopeia A in this region. Then there is Cygnus X over here. So today we'll have a look at the different kinds of radio sources and the physical processes that may be responsible for the radio emission which we see. Uh, my colleague uh, Dipankar will tell you more about radiative processes, but I'll just introduce you briefly to it. Now, if you contrast this image with an optical image of the galaxy, then you can see that it looks very different. It, this is also in a similar coordinate system, but what you see are dark regions as well as bright regions in the galactic plane. And that is because uh, when you look at the night sky, you see the stars, but the stars actually occupy a very small value, volume of space. You can do a little sum for yourself. And if you take the diameter of our sun or the radius of our sun and uh, calculates its volume, and you, and you also calculate the volume uh, which is encompassed by the nearest star, uh, Alpha Centauri system, Proxima Centauri. And you'll find that if you just do dead photo pi r cubes and take the ratio of distances, it's about one part in 10 to the power of 20 or so, a little more than that. and you see these dark patches over here.
emu, and it is high up in the sky where the emu lays the eggs, and you'll find a lot of sculptures related to it. Now, when you look at the stars, you see it in different colors, and the colors are related to the temperature. The hot stars appear blue, and the sort of reddish or orangey stars appear red, just as from the Wien's displacement law, because the radiation from stars can be approximated as black bodies. I must say right now that since, uh, since uh, most of you are undergraduate students, uh, that uh, I'm targeting it at, a, at, a, at that level um, uh, for the more experienced faculty participants. Hopefully there will be new things as well, which you learn from this talk. And uh, uh, yeah, and that was to determine the colors of the stars. The colors of the stars are also affected by the gas and dust. So if it li lies behind very dusty regions or is very far away from us, gas and dust will also affect the color that you see in addition to the temperature of the stars, just as the sun appears sort of reddish when it is rising in the morning or setting in the evening due to scattering in our own atmosphere. Now, for, for thousands of years, actually, man was confined to querying the heavens, studying the he heavens in the optical region of the spectrum. And with slight forays into the infrared and the optic infrared and the ultraviolet region of the spectrum. It was William Herschel, a refugee musician from Hanover, who later became the astronomer royal, uh, that he discovered serendipitously infrared radiation from the sun by just putting a thermometer beyond the red part and seeing if it, if it registers a temperature. Uh, surprisingly, he didn't explore the ultraviolet part as well. It was left to Johann Wilhelm Ritter to discover ultraviolet emission about a year later or so. Now, this was, this was, this was the situation till the early 1930s, that man's understanding of the universe was confined to the optical region of the spectrum. And phenomenal discoveries were, were made right from ancient times to relatively modern times from discovery of the equinox, uh, the precession of the earth by Hipparchus, uh, the Greek astronomer uh, 2000 years ago, roughly, uh, to, to discovery of the expansion of the universe. These are all based on optical observations, ancient times with the human eye, and in the early part of the 20th century with the prevailing telescopes of the time. But this new window, the radio window uh, got opened up due to the work of uh, uh, Karl Jansky. We'll come to that story in a moment. But before that, just to give you an overview of the kinds of the channels of astronomical information that modern astronomy uses. Electromagnetic radiation, the entire region of the electromagnetic spectrum from gamma rays at the highest energies, uh, shortest wavelengths, highest energies and frequencies uh, to the low energy or long wavelength radio waves. Cosmic ray particles, which are generated by energetic events in our galaxy and possibly external galaxies as well. The neutrinos and antineutrinos, uh, which, which actually help us to test models of stellar evolution, perhaps models of nuclei as well, um, active nuclei, um, uh, sorry, energy generation in the, in the centers of stars. Then you also have studies of solid constituents like interstellar dust grains, that may penetrate the solar system, meteorites, lunar samples, and even asteroid samples, which have been picked up by spacecrafts, which have landed recently uh, in an asteroid and picked up a sample and will, and, and will make its way back to Earth. And, and of course, gravitational waves, which, is, uh, which has been the most recent channel of astronomical information. So you can see that modern astronomy relies on a whole spectrum not just electromagnetic radiation, but also cosmic ray particles, neutrinos, antineutrinos, solid constituents and gravitational waves to understand the un and unravel the mysteries and the questions that we ask ourselves of the universe. When I say radio waves, what do I mean and, and how do I observe it? So briefly, I will dwell on that. And then I will give you a glimpse of the kind of astronomical objects and the physical processes responsible for it. If you look at the electromagnetic window, for example, from, uh, from the high energy gamma rays to the long wavelength radio waves, you will find that the, for a major part of the electromagnetic spectrum, that the universe is opaque. 
uh, not a unit that is opaque to us from the earth because of the atmosphere, which absorbs uh, the radiation uh, due to the molecules present over there, or water vapor, carbon dioxide, etc. But two windows which are open where the radiation reaches us, otherwise we wouldn't even be able to see the stars, is the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, 4,000 to 8,000 angstroms, so 400 to 800 nanometers roughly, and the radio region of the spectrum, which reaches us. And radio region of the spectrum, which reaches us is roughly about 10 megahertz or so to the millimeter region over here. Uh, at higher frequencies, again, absorption plays a role. Even in fact, the millimeter wave telescopes which we have, we try to put it on dry spots, high up in the mountains, so that the effects of the atmosphere are minimized. At long wavelengths, uh, for example, below about 10 megahertz or so, uh, this can vary with the solar cycle. It also varies with location on the Earth, but it is the ionosphere uh, above our Earth which cuts, cuts us off from receiving signals from outer space. So if you were to observe at lower frequencies than that, you would have to, put, you have to go outside the, outside the uh, ionosphere, so either spacecrafts or at some day, if we put a telescope on the moon, then you'd be able to observe at lower frequencies than that. The next slide actually basically illustrates the same effect. It just shows you, you know, uh, it shows you uh, the depth of penetration of different frequencies of light into the Earth's atmosphere. And as I said uh, earlier, that uh, at very long radio waves below about 10 megahertz or so, roughly, that the ionosphere cuts us off and otherwise it reaches us. Then when you go to the millimeter and infrared region, again, it gets cut off. And, and the visible region is, uh, is what is available to us. And then again, if you go to ultraviolet X-rays and gamma rays, you have to go outside the atmosphere. So it's done by satellites, spacecrafts, initial days, rockets and balloons played an important role in red aircraft, also flew observatories. Just to reflect on a moment about the visible region of the spectrum, that, uh, that, that uh, the spectrum of our sun on which we depend uh, to sustain us is, is uh, at about close to about 6,000 degrees Kelvin. And the peak of that, uh, of the Planckian curve also lies in this region of the spectrum. So if the sun was much cooler, it would radiate at longer wavelengths. If it was much hotter, it would radiate at shorter wavelengths. So it is, it is a bit of a coincidence perhaps that, uh, um, that, uh, that the visible region of the spectrum to which our atmosphere is transparent is so closely matched to the temperature of the sun, which also peaks in the visible region of the spectrum. And the fact that our eyes are also tuned to observe in this wavelength range must be due to the biological evolution of the human eye. Now, as far as radio waves are concerned, I said about 30 meters, if you look at it in terms of wavelength, it's about 30 meters to about a millimeter or so. So as you saw from the graph as well, that it's a huge range in terms of, uh, in terms of the, uh, in terms of the ratio of the wavelengths or the frequencies at which you can observe. For example, in the optical region, it's just a factor of two, whereas in the radio region, it's about 30,000 to one. But in spite of there being a huge window, there is a huge demand for the radio frequencies. The mobiles that you use today or, or television transmission or, uh, um, or, or uh, uh, communication, whether it, be whether it be aeronautics, there, there's a huge demand. And this chart just shows you the how, how strongly contested are different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. This is from the United States frequency allocations. And if you like for radio astronomers, this is the enemy actually, because, uh, because often devices, even if they're not allowed, they spill over into very precious bands with which we make our observations. And these signals, are far, far, far stronger than what we are trying to detect with our radio telescopes when we try to reach the furthest reaches of the universe. But there are certain very important frequency bands for radio astronomy. I'll mention that in a moment. Uh, and these bands are specifically protected. 
and nobody else is allowed to transmit in them. For example, the, the transition of neutral atomic hydrogen, which we'll meet today at 21 centimeters is something which is very precious for radio astronomy, precious for science uh, as a whole. And that is something which is, which is protected. Similarly, there are other bands which have varying degrees of protection. And you can have a look at this chart in Google. I'm, I'm not sure you can actually read what it is, but you can see gives a visual impression of how precious the spectrum is and how hard radio astronomers have to uh, fight to keep their toe hold in it and also invent ingenious methods of suppressing uh, interference and making sure that the bands in which you're observing are not affected by different forms of interference. Just to give you a, a thumb rule for what is a radio wave, um, I've just put a scale over here that if you can measure with a ruler, the wavelength, it's a radio wave, okay? So it ranges from millimeters to meters, but you can take your scale over several times and you can measure it. Uh, whereas uh, when you come to optical, you know, 4,000 angstroms or 400 nanometers is not something which you'll be able to measure with a ruler, okay? Now, how did this whole, uh, whole start? How did a radio window open up at all? The first major window that was outside the optical, as I mentioned, is a radio window which opened up. And this was due to um, the very pioneering efforts of Karl Jansky. Uh, but again, like many discoveries in astronomy, it was a serendipitous discovery. Karl Jansky was working at Bell Labs when he was trying to investigate uh, sources of uh, interference in communications across the Atlantic. Uh, those days, uh, frequencies for transmission were, were low. And he built this antenna to look at sources of electrical disturbance at 20.5 megahertz. And he could identify different sources of noise. There were more distant thunderstorms, nearby thunderstorms, etc. And But in addition, he found a steady hiss, which he could not attribute to any known sources of noise. And from a series of observations, he could identify from which region of the sky the source was coming from. The noise was coming from. And after some observations, he established that this was towards the center of our galaxy. So in 1933, he published a paper entitled Electrical Disturbances Apparently of Extraterrestrial Origin. And it did not take the world by storm, really, because partly it almost all, why almost all astronomers at that time were optical astronomers unfamiliar with the techniques of radio astronomy. And nobody thought that the universe would be radiating at radio wavelengths. And, and also he addressed this to the community of radio engineers rather than the astronomers. But that was the early days of radio astronomy. One did not even know what was responsible for the emission, the physical process, process for it. And in honor of this man who, who, who serendipitously discovered radio emission from outside our system, outside our terrestrial environment. The unit of flux density is named after Jansky and one Jansky is 10 to the power of minus 26 watts per hertz per meter squared. You can see how small a number this is. It's 10 to the power of minus 26. But by today's standards, a one Jansky source would be considered very strong. The giant meter wave radio telescope at uh, at, uh, located outside Pune, built by the National Center for Radio Astrophysics of TIFR. I mean, it'll go to Microjensky levels. So you can imagine how, how far we have gone in terms of trying to observe the universe. And you can imagine what a devastating effect uh, interference in these bands could have uh, because these signals, which man-made uh, signals are far, far stronger than the weak signals we are trying to detect from the far reaches of space. Now, to understand what the nature of the origin might be, we need to know the spectrum. Um, and we need to know the spectrum, which means how does the flux density vary with frequency? Now, th this was another pioneering uh, radio astronomer, Grote Reber, who, who built an antenna in the backyard. He wanted to, he wanted to replicate, uh, uh, investigate, Jansky's discovery of radio emission, apparently of extraterrestrial origin. And he initially built antenna, he tried to detect at higher frequencies, which he did not detect. And then he detected emission 
at about 160 megahertz. At about 160 megahertz. Now, what did what this told him straight away is that when you look at how the emission is changing with frequency, it was much less than what Jansky had observed. So as you go higher in frequency, the, the emission was getting lower, the flux density was getting lower. Or, so this told you that it had a spectrum which was very different from a black body spectrum. Okay. Now, uh, what was the source of emission? What is responsible for this emission? People played around with different ideas in the beginning, but it was the contributions of the Russian astrophysicists as well, Ginsberg, Shlovsky, et cetera, which, uh, um, which showed that this is, this, is, this is due to a highly relativistic electrons, which are gyrating in a weak magnetic field or in a magnetic field, giving rise to what, is, what was earlier called magneto strano but which is more commonly now known as synchrotron radio emission. So what Carl Reber, what Carl Jansky discovered and Groth Reber's observations established that we were seeing a new kind of emission process as well from our galaxy, which is highly relativistic particles moving at nearly the speed of light, gyrating in a magnetic field and giving rise to radio emission by synchrotron emission. In India, Carl Jansky and Groth Reber were in a way the fathers of radio astronomy. In Govind, in, in India, the efforts were led by um, Govind Sarup, who had established our group at NCRA, uh, starting initially at GIFR Bombay, then at UTI, and later and with a brief stay in Bangalore, and then later at UTI, and later at Pune. And, and these are just pictures of two of the telescopes which he and our team had built and uh, led by him. And this is the UT radio telescope, which is about half a kilometer long and 30 meters wide, operating at 327 megahertz. And this is the giant meter wave radio telescope, uh, which, which, is, uh, which you'll hear more about from uh, my colleague Ishwar Chandra from NCR as a part of this set of lectures. Unfortunately, in the pandemic mode, we're not able to actually physically take you there. Um, and these antennas are located in uh, spread over about close to about 30 kilometers or so. And, uh, and, and, and it's basically a low frequency telescope operating till about 1400 megahertz, starting about 150 megahertz or so are the frequencies of routine observations. This telescope was upgraded recently and has also received an IEEE milestone plug from it or note from it, recognition from it. Now, when we talk of telescopes, there are two things we want to do. Uh, we want to be aware of, and one is the angular resolution of the telescope, and the other is the sensitivity. How, how deep can we go? How faint a signal can we detect? And, and what details can we see uh, with our telescope? Now, the angular resolution of a single antenna telescope is uh, approximately one by two lambda by t, which is nothing but the Rayleigh criterion You'd be familiar with it from diffraction, from studies of Aries discs, et cetera, okay? Uh, but if you look at, for example, the human eye, you can apply the same principles and you will get a resolution of about an arc minute or so. Although our pupils are small, um, the wavelength we're dealing with is also very small. But when you come to, come to radio waves, the radio waves are long. So when you go to, when you look at resolutions of a single dish, for example, this is the Green Bank uh, telescope, the 100 meter telescope, and which operates from about 0.1 to 116 gigahertz. And this just gives you the beam shape, the response at two frequencies. One is at nine gigahertz and the other is 109.4 gigahertz. And this is about 82 arc seconds or so. And this is about six point arc seconds or so. The scales on the X axis are very different, although the plot looks sort of roughly similar. And this is just given by the expression of one by two lambda by t. Now, if you want to get better resolution, you have to uh, you have to make either bigger antennas and bigger antennas. There are bigger antennas, for example, now in China. Unfortunately, the Arecibo telescope has had to be decommissioned because of accidents which occurred recently. Uh, but they're not they, they they're not easily steerable. When you make big telescopes, they're not steerable. They can be electronically steered to a degree like as it was done in the Arecibo telescope, but it is single dishes which can be rotated in all regions of the sky. 
but but you really cannot build the kind of telescopes that are required to achieve arc second kind of resolution. Now, just to give an idea of what 82 arc second means, uh, this is roughly more than an arc minute or so. The resolution of the human eye is about roughly about an arc minute. It varies because your pupils also change sizes depending upon whether you're looking at you know, bright light or darkness. You know, and you know, so it adjusts itself. So there'll be little variations, et cetera, but it's roughly in the ballpark of an arc minute. So you can see that this huge antenna, 100 meters at about nine gigahertz has a slightly worse resolution than the human eye. Now, if you want to get higher resolutions, then a technique of interferometry, uh, the techniques which Desh, my colleague and friend would talk to you about later, uh, you have to combine signals by, from different antennas as though you're recording signal from a single antenna of this size. So the resolution is not then given by a diameter of a single dish, but the separation of the longest pair of antennas. This is a picture, an aerial picture of the very large array. Uh, you had a picture of the giant beta wave radio telescope where the antennas are fixed in location. Uh, this one, they can actually move it on rails where the lar largest separation is about, uh, it's again, is about 30 kilometers or so. And in its most compact um, configuration, just a couple of few kilometers or so. And this operates from about 70 megahertz to about 43 gigahertz or 40,000 megahertz or so. And the antenna beam of a single antenna varies from about 10 degrees to about an arc minute. And the resolutions are better. They are, when they're more compact, uh, you, get a, you get a coarser resolution. When you take them further away, then you get a better resolution or higher resolution. Now, if you ask yourself, what is it that you want really? Uh, do you want more resolution or do you want uh, coarser resolution? That depends on the science question that you ask yourself. For example, if you want to detect diffuse regions of emission, then you want to go for lower, lower resolution uh, because, uh, because, you're, because it's like seeing, seeing sort of a forest. If you look at, the, if you have, if you're really pointed at the bark of a tree, then you, you miss the larger scale structure. And if you see the, if you have a resolution which will see the forest as a whole, you will not see the small scale structure. Um, Desh will probably take you in more detail into that. Uh, in the language of Fourier transforms, you sample in the Fourier domain, the components um, which, which, are, which are due to small scale structure when, you're, when your antennas are spaced far apart. And you sample the components which, which come from the large scale structure when, you, when your antennas are close by or when you have single dish antennas. So depending on the scientific questions that you have in mind, they're both, they're both relevant and important. And often today, we actually combine data from both low and high resolution to get a complete picture or a more complete picture of what a radio source in the sky might look like. Now, just to give you uh, some sort of an idea of, uh, of uh, resolution again, I hope I was doing this late last night when my computer was giving problems and, and I hope the numbers are correct. But if you take a, uh, but you can check it out. You, if you take a five rupees coin and you place it at a distance of 100 meters or so, it should subtend an angle, res, angle, angle of about 47 arc seconds or so. So you just, it's just about uh, that much. But, but today, routinely, actually, we are, we are achieving resolutions by, by combining antennas located at very far locations of the Earth. Here, you cannot take them via optical fibers or waveguides, but you record them and bring to a central correlator and process them. So this is an image of the very large baseline, very long baseline array in the United States, where you, where you have antennas separated by several thousands of kilometers from the Virgin Islands to Hawaii, and it is not just a very long baseline array. You also have a European VLB network, and there are times when all the antennas are linked up together to form a global array. You achieve the highest resolutions that you can. Many of you may have seen the image of the black hole uh, by the Event Horizon Telescope, which was, which was, uh, which, which, which required the highest possible resolutions, and were linked up and done with telescopes located all over the globe. And they also went to the highest frequencies because as you can see, it is not just the separation, but the frequency also plays a role in the highest resolutions 
that you can achieve. Now, going back to the sources of emission, uh, we'll, uh, we, this is an image which I showed you in the first slide, which is at 408 megahertz. And this is a slide which is made more recently at 1420, uh, at 1420 megahertz, which is about 20 centimeters or so. Um, this combines data with both from the northern and southern hemispheres. And it is the spectra, which is spectral, spectra and polarization, give us information on what is the nature of emission that we are seeing. And as I mentioned earlier, that from Carl Jansky's and Rod Reaver's observations, the bulk of the low frequency emission is due to synchrotron emission of, of highly relativistic particles gyrating in the magnetic field. But there are individual regions of emission, for example, regions of gas, which are ionized by hot stars, where you can also get thermal free free uh, emission. So if you look at the center of our galaxy, you will get emission which is both non-thermal or in the plane of our galaxy, thermal as well as non-thermal. The large scale diffuse emission, which you see over here, is largely non-thermal emission. Besides angular resolution, the other quest, as I mentioned earlier, is sensitivity. And, we, and I mentioned that telescopes such as the VLA, the GMRT, go down to you know, micro Jansky levels. But what does the sensitivity depend upon? It depends upon the size of the antenna, the effective area. So larger the antenna you have, the more sensitive you are. And if you're combining antennas together as an interferometer, then it depends on the number of pairs you can build up. Then the larger the bandwidth which you can observe it, the more sensitive you are. And the larger, the, the longer time you integrate with it, the more sensitive you are. Now, obviously you cannot increase this indefinitely because radio frequency interference is going to play a role. So you have to choose your bands and have clever algorithms for removing uh, radio frequency interference from the band in which you're observing. Time would also be limited because of the available time the hundreds of fellow astronomers were competing for the same time and time will be chopped up and divided. And you also perhaps want to observe many sources. So, but the longer, but depending upon what your science goals are, you will adjust your uh, integration time or the time of duration of your observations to try and reach the sensitivity that you want. If your, your electronics, et cetera, is also going to generate noise, which we'll know a lot more about. And the noisier your system is, the less sensitive you are. So you'll find that at high frequencies, they would actually cool the receivers cryogenically to try and decrease the noise. And modern technology has made it or enabled it to so really have low noise systems. So the system, so sensitivity is one aspect of it. The other aspect I want to allude to is, is what is called confusion when you look at the sky. For example, this is a 45 degree region, square degree region of the sky, imaged at 1.4 gigahertz with a resolution of about 12 arc minutes. This telescope also collapsed, this NRO, this is an old survey, and, uh, and the sensitivity, the RMS noise in the image is about 20 millijanskis per beam. But what you're seeing over here, these blips and all that, they are actually well, uh, they're not due to the noise itself, but they're due to a lot of weak background sources, which have not been resolved with the telescope, which you see over here with the, with the telescope beam. So you can notice that when you have a broad beam, there could be many other weaker sources or weak sources, which you may not be able to resolve. And in the universe, there are far more weaker sources than stronger sources, the way the source flux density is distributed. Now, if I extract just a four degree square region from it, and observe, and observe it with the very uh, with higher resolution. This is an image made with the contours uh, are, are from here, whereas the grayscale is an image made with the very large area with a resolution of 45 arc seconds, close to the resolution of the human eye. So these dots which you see are, are the lower, are the, are the for the higher resolution images. You can see there are a lot of small, 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 small dots over here, which are all sources which have not been clearly resolved out when you look at it with very coarse resolutions. So these are also aspects one needs to bear in mind when you're trying to look at the radio universe. 
And some of the most exciting discoveries in radio astronomy or in astronomy and astrophysics have been trying to find out, understand what these blobs of emission might be because you see a source in the sky, but you have to ask yourself, what is it associated with it? What is the physics behind it? Uh, what is giving rise to this radio emission? And some of the most exotic objects in the universe have been, find, have been, have been found by trying to find counterparts of this radio emission at other wavelengths, particularly in the optical region of the spectrum, because that was the most well studied at that period of time. A brief overview of uh, the radiation processes. Uh, I have another about 25 minutes and I'll just give you a brief overview because uh, of the kinds of objects that we have looked at. And, uh, and my friend Depankar will take you at greater lengths through that. So radiation can be both continuum as well as line emission at radio frequencies as well, just as you're familiar with at, um, at the optical region of the spectrum. Thermal emission is from plasma or gaseous plasma or plasma which is at uh, or, or bodies which are at thermal equilibrium for a gas with velocity distribution is given by the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and non-thermal processes where, um, where particles will not have a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and they're not in thermal equilibrium in that sense. Now, what are the kind of bodies and where do you see them? What are the processes? Uh, one of the processes, of course, thermal brainstorming itself. Suppose you ionize a gas, um, you take it to high temperatures, it'll be largely ionized. There'll be electron ion collisions, acceleration of electrons will give rise to the radiation which you observe. Velocity distribution can be described by a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And higher the temperature, higher will be the velocity of the particles and higher the frequency of radiation. For example, if you take very hot plasma, which is at millions of degrees Kelvin, over, over a million degrees Kelvin, perhaps 10, over, perhaps over 10 to 100 million degrees Kelvin. Then at, at those kind of temperatures, the radiation which you observe will be the X region of the spectrum. But when you take lower temperatures, for example, in a region of ionized hydrogen, which has an equilibrium temperature of about 10 to the power of 4K, 10,000 degrees Kelvin, you're going to see radio emission uh, due to the free free process from regions of ionized hydrogen. And this is a thermal process and so, and so there is no fixed, there is no magnetic field involved. There is no fixed orientation involved and the radiation would be unpolarized. So these are two, this is just an example of the Orion Nebula. The Orion constellation is a winter constellation which you can see now. And this is a Hubble Space Telescope image of the, of the Orion Nebula where due to the different species and temperatures, you get different colors. And this is a radio image of it combining data from both the Green Bank Telescope, which you saw, and the very large array, where somewhat higher resolution and low resolution have been confined to make this image, which shows the diffuse outer structures emission, as well as some of the small scale structure within it. And this emission over here is largely thermal Bremsstrahlung emission, which actually uh, uh, decreases sharply at low frequencies and is nearly flat at higher frequencies. So at high frequencies, when you observe them, uh, you are likely to pick up a, a number of these uh, high frequent a number of these uh, regions of ionized hydrogen. If you did a survey with high resolution of our of our galaxy, these are processes again you're familiar with from your basic physics, black body radiation. But you can imagine that at radio waves, if you want to see it, it has to be very cool. If you had very high bodies again at, in, the, in, the, in the ballpark of million degrees, millions of degrees Kelvin, you would see it in the extreme region of the spectrum. Okay, <clears throat> 10 to about 0 0.0 to nanometers. But at radio wavelengths, it has to be very cold uh, if it had to be a black body radiation. The most striking and famous example of black body radiation is of course the cosmic microwave background radiation. And uh, Tate, my colleague and friend from NCRA will talk to you about about uh, cosmology and radio astronomy, but I'm just giving it as an example of, of, uh, of the, perhaps the most perfect black body curve that you will see. And tiny fluctuations, which you see, this is made by the Wilkinson microwave, microwave and isotropy probe, whereas this is from the Cosmic Background Explorer, which predates this. And you have more recent images from Planck mission as well. Uh, these tiny fluctuations, are signatures of the early fluctuations which occurred, which led to the formation 
of galaxies and structure, structures and galaxies, uh, such as the one we live in. And this is something which Tito is going to cover when he talks about radio astronomy and cosmology. Synchrotron emission I have referred to earlier, this is what we see in a diffuse emission from our galaxy. And in a lot of active galaxies, which I will cover in my second talk in this winter school. And these are really ultra-red relativistic particles moving at nearly the velocity of light. They're accelerated in a magnetic field due to the Lorentz force. And when you do the relativistic transformations from the kind of dipolar pattern for a non-relativistic or a mildly relativistic uh, electron moving around, the, forward, the emission is confined to a forward cone. And what you see, what you would see from a single electron is a series of pulses, but uh, when the cone sweeps his or her line of sight, but the harmonics of this are so closely spaced that you, what you basically see is a continuum. And most of the energy for a single electron is emitted at a frequency, which is given by the Lorentz factor of the electron and the perpendicular component of the magnetic field. I think all you need to know is that it depends most strongly on the energy of the electron, uh, which is basically represented by the uh, Lorentz factor of the electron over here. So that if you had a Lorentz factor of about 10 to the power of four, which corresponds to, you can see, 0.9999999 times the velocity of light, almost the velocity of light, moving in a field of just 10 microgauss, that would emit, emit radiation at about a gigahertz, which is roughly in the ballpark of 20 centimeters. Slightly less than your one foot ruler or scale, which you may have. So you can see the kind of velocities which are involved and they have to be accelerated to these energies by explosive or energetic events in our galaxy or external galaxies. But the reason why Carl Jansky and Groth Reber uh, saw a power law kind of spectrum or a steep spectrum was because a single electron may emit peak at a, at a frequency, depending upon how energetic it is, the more energetic it is, the higher will be the frequency, stronger the magnetic field, the higher would be the frequency. But there is a whole spectrum of electrons going from low energies to high energies. And there are many more of the low energy electrons than of the high energy electrons. And this we understand in terms of shock acceleration processes or acceleration processes, which generate this kind of power law spectrum for the electrons which are radiating. Now, synchrotron radiation would be linearly polarized, is polarized. And you, can, and, and you can find polarizations up to about 70% or so. Uh, this has actually been observed as well in, in diffused lobes of emission. And you can Im imagine, you can, you can say to figure out that if it is a magnetic field which is aligned and the radiation is uh, due to electrons moving around um, the magnetic field, you'd naturally get emission which is polarized. But this radiation can also be depolarized if the fields are tangled up or if there is you know, rotation due to Faraday effects by a magneto-ionic medium, which is either within the source itself or outside it. Don't worry too much about it right now, the details which you're talking, we can discuss it in one later, but just remember the synchrotron process is a non-thermal process by ultra relativistic electrons and magnetic fields. And one of the characteristics would be uh, polarization in addition to the power law spectrum. The other process which plays a role is what is called inverse Compton scattering. Normally one in textbooks in undergraduate or postgraduate classes, you learn about a Compton effect where photon scatters off a station electron and gives energy to the electron and loses energy. But in a, in a radio source, for example, where the electrons, as you saw, are highly energetic, they could interact with low frequency photons, okay, give it energy, and low frequency uh, photons can be sort of upscattered to higher frequencies by the Lorentz factor. So the upscattered frequency is given by gamma squared nu. So if you had, for example, a radiation at, um, one gigahertz, which is 10 to the power of nine megahertz, and you had the same electron of 10 to the power of four, which gives rise to this emission, then you will see the 10 to the power of four, 10 to the power of eight, plus 10 to the, plus 10 to the power into 10 to the power of nine, will give you 10 to the power of 17. So it goes up into the X-ray region of the spectrum. 
I'll not get into too much detail over here. I'll cover a little bit of the radio, uh, of the line emission as well. One of the most important lines in radio astronomy is the neutral atomic hydrogen, which occurs at 21 centimeters, which is due to the spin flip transition of hydrogen, which my colleague and friend from NCR and SM is going to talk to you about. And, and basically most of the hydrogen that exists in the universe and within our galaxy is cold. So electrons are all at the n equal to one level. So the only way you can detect it is through this transition of neutral atomic hydrogen. Um, there is no other way that you can detect it. And it is absolutely important, not only to understand our galaxy, and because it's a line, you can follow its motion, the dynamics of galaxies, as well as uh, initially how galaxies form uh, by looking at uh, how neutral hydrogen uh, emission or neutral hydrogen properties which from of the gas clouds which collapsed to form the first structures. Besides atomic hydrogen, you can also get recombination lines. You're more familiar with the Lyman alpha, Lyman Bama, uh, et cetera, series of hydrogen, but at radio frequencies, because they are low energies, it will be much higher values of N. For example, this is H109 alpha, which means from transitions from N equal to 110 to 109, and you can get a transition at about five gigahertz or so. So these are useful for probing regions of ionized hydrogen, for example, where, where, where you want to understand temperatures and densities and when the physics of these lines uh, are used to try and infer that. You also get molecular lines, for example, in a millimeter wave region of the spectrum due to the rotational and vibrational and transition context, the transition levels, and, and these are extremely important for studying the dense regions of the interstellar medium, which collapse to form clouds. Carbon monoxide transitions are one of the very well-studied ones, but you can also, you can see the plethora of lines that have been identified. This is from a particular molecular cloud towards the center of our galaxy. In addition to that, you can also get maser emission. And this is a water vapor maser emission where there's an inversion of pop population level. And you can also map these not only in our galaxy, uh, in star forming regions, for example, but also in external galaxies. This is one in a galaxy called NGC 4258, where the water vapor maser spots have been imaged with very high resolution, milli arc second resolution. You can see this is uh, 2.9 milli arc seconds, okay, which is just about uh, uh, distances of a parsec, uh, 0.1 of a parsec. One parsec is about three light years. And, and because these are spectral lines, you can study its motion, and then you can apply Kepler's laws, and you can find out what kind of mass the central object should be. Should be. And these, uh, um, the, the, these studies by uh, several groups have confirmed that it has a supermassive black hole of about 40 solar mass, 40 million solar masses or so. I'll just take you briefly for the rest of the time with the kind of radio sources we see and uh, um, uh, in another 10 minutes and then I'll wind up. Uh, a lot of these will be studied in much greater detail or uh, discussed in much greater detail by my colleagues. Um, this is on the sun, which Divya is going to talk to you about. And again, in the sun, uh, there are various processes which are responsible for the radio emission. It is one of the strongest sources in the sky, uh, thermal bremsstrahlung, plasma processes, gyrosynchrotron emission, and that really depends on the frequency at which you're observing. And the frequency at which you're observing is also related to the layer from which the emission is originating. For example, the low frequency emission will not originate from deep inside from the outer, but from the outer layers of the chromosphere, outer parts of the chromosphere. Then planets and even our moon is visible. This is thermal emission from it. This is an image which I got from Chris Salter, which is made with the ARAM 30 meter telescope at millimeter wavelengths at 230 gigahertz. Now, this is uh, an image which was, I think, made by Imke de Pater. I couldn't get the original. I took it from somebody's Twitter page. And um, the recent conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, this is what it would look like in a radio image. And, and both of these, Jupiter particularly, has very strong dipolar field, a very prominent magnetosphere. And these are actually the radio emission is generated by synchrotron emission um, of uh, high energy particles moving in this magnetic field. Saturn also has a magnetic sphere, magnetosphere, which is responsible for the radio emission. And you can see the disk 
and the main body as well over there. This is a radio image of the conjunction. Stars like our sun are going to evolve. Uh, and when they evolve in later stages of their evolution, uh, that will be several billion years from now, so we don't need to worry. It's going to shed its outer layers. And these appear uh, as, as diffuse blobs of, of light, which emit thermal emission um, heated by the central star. And, and these are on the right are HST images from it. This is just one radio image of a planetary nebula called K335. And this is made, was made with a very large array. And you can see an image of just the outer layers in the process of being shed by the star. So this is an example of, of thermal free free emission from thermal emission from, uh, from the plasma, which, is, which form the outer layers of the star and is now being emitted. But that happens to a mass star like our sun. Stars more massive than our sun, greater than about eight solar masses or so, will end their lives in catastrophic events called supernova remnants. Supernova remnants are highly energetic events generating very high energy particles. And as they move outwards, they compress the magnetic field of the galaxy as well. Here is a composite image of the radio in red. The green is optical, which also contains emission lines of oxygen three, et cetera. And the blue is the X-rays. You can see hot thermal gas heated to millions of degrees Kelvin, high energy particles generating radio emission due to synchrotron emission. And, uh, and this is sort of typical of many of the supernova remnants that you would see. This is just um, a supernova 1987A in a large Magellanic cloud. Uh, due to shortage of time, I'll probably not spend too much time on it, except to say that these supernova remnants, when they explode, they leave behind a compact star called a neutron star. Low mass stars like our sun will end its life as a white dwarf when nuclear reactions in the center are no longer possible and it will cool down and, and, and will remain in space forever and, uh, and it is called a white dwarf. When it is initially born, it is very hot and you'll be able to see it uh, in, in X-rays and later in optical, um, but, but when it cools below protection threads, so you'll see it in the infrared but it'll just cool down to low temperatures. But these massive stars leave behind a star which is supported by largely by neutron degeneracy pressure. And supernova 1987A, you may have read, was one which went off in the LMC, and it was one of the closest supernovae, which is studied in great detail. Neutrinos were discovered from it. But there was a puzzle for a long time as to what happened to the neutron star. And this was very recently again that radio emission was det detected by ALMA, which is believed to be due to dust, which has been heated by the neutron star in its vicinity. There seems to be unanimity on it, and these results are very recent. You can see they are from just this particular year, uh, whereas the explosion was detected in 1987. So they leave behind neutron stars, which are very rapidly rotating, which uh, a number of my colleagues are going to talk about, Devarati from Ayuka, Baljan Joshi from NCRA, and they should perhaps also be talking about it. And, and Prakash has a project on detecting pulsars from the Vela pulsar with the UTI radio telescope. So you can see these are, these are rotating stars which, are, which rotate very rapidly with periods ranging from milliseconds to seconds. And they have a very strong magnetic field from 10 to the power of 12 to 15 Gauss or so. And particles accelerated in this dipolar field which give rise to pulse radio emission observed by us when the axis keeps hitting us. I'll skip this. These are just images again of synchrotron emission, which is being generated in, in other galaxies. In our galaxy, we cannot, uh, we, we are inside it, so we can't get a good view of it. But in external galaxies, you can get a beautiful view of both face on galaxies and edge on galaxies. Galaxies will be oriented randomly respect to us but we can pick out the ones depending upon what our areas of interest are. And these vectors which you see are the, gives you the orientation of the magnetic fields. The, this is another exciting area of research as to understand how do these large scale magnetic fields arise. And the various dynamo models which Kandasavi Subramanian from Ayuka has made a lot of contributions and it's very close to his um, areas of interest. And these, these, these uh, relativistic particles also diffuse outwards to form these halos of emission, which are difficult to see when the galaxy is face on, but it is wonderful to see when it is, uh, when it is edge on. And these are used to constrain models 
of cosmic ray propagation in magnetic fields. There are many major projects going on. This is another illustration of it. Now, I'll spend the last five minutes just talking about the 21 centimeter line and what we have learned from it. Uh, we have already mentioned that this is due to this hyperfine transition of hydrogen, um, where the proton and uh, pro proton and electron spins are aligned, parallel versus antiparallel. And this was actually predicted by uh, uh, Van de Hulst in 1944. Jan Wood actually set him on this path. The very famous Dutch astronomers, and it was detected soon after the war was over. Uh, the war actually helped develop uh, radio astronomy technology to quite an extent, and several people after the war effort, you know, led pioneering groups in radio astronomy. Uh, Bernard Lovell and uh, and Martin Ryle in England, and so these lines, the, this hydrogen was detected soon after the war effort. Now, because it is a line, because it's a line, we can follow its motion and, and we can find out uh, how galaxies may be moving and rotating. In a spiral galaxy, for example, for example is shown here, our galaxy is also a spiral galaxy. Uh, the rest emission is at 1420 megahertz. Uh, this will be redshifted because of the cosmological expansion. But when it is rotating, the ones towards you will be blue shifted the ones going away will be further redshifted relative to the systemic velocity. So what you will get, and often in the central region, because of the stars, et cetera, which are forming, which are over there, there is a depletion in emission, whereas along the edges, all the emission will add up and giving rise to this kind of uh, curve, which you see over here, where the y-axis is intensity and the x-axis can be frequency, which can be translated to velocity. So. So this is the kind of curve which you get. Now from, uh, from and okay, this I will skip, I think, okay? From, from the studies of these galaxies, one can find out how galaxies are rotating. And often you'll find that the extent of the H1 emission, this is an extreme example, that the neutral hydrogen could far exceed the, what you see in the optical region of the spectrum. So it gives us a way of trying to study dynamics of galaxies way beyond what you can see in the optical region of the spectrum. And, and these studies actually reveal a variety of things. For example, just as stars um, occur in groups and clusters, galaxies occur in groups and clusters as well, and galaxies interact with each other. And when they interact with each other, they harass each other, they try to strip gas off each other, they try to coalesce, they combine, larger galaxies swallow up smaller galaxies, all kinds of interesting things take place whose dynamics you can, you can study by looking at the properties of galaxies. But the thing which I want to point out is, for example, how are the galaxies moving? If you, for example, take, uh, uh, take the planets in our, in our solar system, if you had a massive body sitting at the center or the major spots in NGC 4258, which I showed you earlier, that their velocities would go down as you go further away, uh, according to Kepler's laws, okay, one upon root r. Now, if you look at the galaxy, how it is moving away from the center, initially it seems to rotate like a solid body, okay? V is equal to r omega. So it, it, then once the central bulge of stars is open over, you would expect the emission to go down. You can take account of the fact that there are stars in the disk as well, but even then you would like, you would find that the velocity should go down. But when you actually observe these gases, uh, the neutral hydrogen velocities, they seem to have a flat curve. And the only way that we can understand this is that there is dark matter associated with every galaxy. And this dark matter is what gives the potential to hold the galaxy together and gives rise to this flat rotation curve, which we see. So to give the flat rotation curve, your mass has to increase with radius. And for mass to increase with radius, this is, this is the kind of halo uh, contribution that you will see. Uh, so this is just showing the same example of the halo and the disc component, um, precisely what I said just now. So this, is, this has been one of the very strong evidences of dark matter, which uh, makes up about 23% of our universe. You know that 4% is only baryonic matter, which you see, and then 73% or so is dark energy which we don't have a clue as to what it is. 
but in our own galaxy, we are sitting inside it. So we can't see the kind of curves which you see over there, but we can still try to infer how the clouds are moving along different directions and infer the rotation of the galaxy. And this has been done, and this is the kind of profiles which you will see, and depending upon which direction it is inclined and the rotation of the galaxy, you will pick up different velocity components. You can model them and understand the rotation of a galaxy from neutral hydrogen as well. Uh, I'll, I should close now. Uh, this is just to sort of a concluding statement to, to sort of prelude you to, um, uh, to the talk on active galaxies, that this is, this is an ultra deep uh, Hubble field, which is tens of thousands of galaxies. And a small fraction of these are active in the sense that they show unusual activity beyond the stellar evolution or the evolution of stars with which we associate ourselves, the passive evolution of stars. So many of these would be active galaxies and they manifest themselves in intense bursts of star formation or uh, which cannot be sustained over the lifetime of the galaxy. For example, our galaxy forms stars at about one to two solar masses per year. This could be a thousand times larger, hundred to thousand times larger. And when intense stars are formed, as I said, the massive stars explode as supernovae. These hot young stars, the massive stars also ionize gas in its vicinity. And the ones which explode, you see them as supernova remnants with a shell structure. The ones which are ionizing hydrogen, you'll see them as you see in the Orion Nebula. So when you look at this, op this is the optical image, this is a composite image of optical X-rays, etc. When you look at that with the radio, you see both the non-thermal regions of emission, which are the supernova remnants. And some of these are also regions of ionized hydrogen. So you can actually map this with milli arc second resolution, follow them year by year, and also see how they expand, how they change, and model them in terms of their interaction with interstellar medium. But some of the most exotic classes of objects that we've seen are those which have lobes of radio emission on either side of an optical galaxy. This traveling distances of, of millions of parsecs uh, away from the parent galaxy where it started off by jets of plasma squirting at relative distant velocities. So the purpose of this talk was to just give you a glimpse of the exciting and beautiful window that radio astronomy has helped unveil uh, as it was the first major window to be opened up but as we go along, we'll also see that other parts of the window are also equally important in terms of trying to understand, uh, understand our universe and its constituents. For example, this is a spectrum of the galaxy which I showed you, which is a nearby galaxy, M82, just 12 million light years away. And what you see over here is the synchrotron emission, which, you picked up, which I showed you the radio image for. And also there is, there's a bit of a contribution from H2 regions as well over here but that's small compared to the synchrotron emission. And these huge bumps which you see is because of gas and dust, which has been heated up, dust which has been heated up to high temperatures by the intense bursts of star formation. And there are two components of dust over here at different temperatures. So you see two different peaks. You can see these are highly luminous in the infrared and they will be picked up at the, at the infrared part of the spectrum. But to probe the deep interior regions of these galaxies, Radio is the best way because it suffers the least extinction or absorption and you can look right into the hearts of galaxies and discover what they're telling us. So I will end with that. And uh, I sort of exceeded my time by a minute or two. Uh, if there are any quick questions, I'll take it. Otherwise, uh, anyway, I'll be available for, uh, we'll be available for you know, any further discussions that you might want to I want, want on whatever, whether it be the physics or whether it be the techniques. And depending upon your requirements, we will uh, we can set up different Zoom slots as well, in addition to what has been scheduled in the program. Particularly the experiments, I think you'll require, uh, you may require more discussions. So but the groups which have been made and selected. And so I will end right now. If any quick questions, I could take it. Uh, otherwise, uh, we will close. Hello. Yeah. 
Yeah, hi sir. It was a wonderful talk given by you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, what are your views regarding building a radio telescope on the moon? I, I think I think it'll happen someday. Uh, uh, we are, we of course have to be careful of not creating more debris in space and all that. Uh, and now, right now, for example, if you take the sun, if you take the sun, the emission uh, below 10 megahertz or so, roughly of that order, uh, it is not observable from the Earth. But spacecrafts have been able to look at emission at lower frequencies by going beyond the ionosphere. But uh, you can do some amount of it in spacecrafts. But uh, but I think. Uh, you know, someday it'll come. I mean, it won't be in my lifetime, I think, but someday it'll come because it has been discussed actively for many years now. And there could be a lot of interesting physics we could learn at a very low frequency end of the spectrum. In fact, when, um, in fact, because uh, if you look at the history of the development of radio astronomy, uh, the early work was done uh, at low frequencies in the sense that hundreds of megahertz or so, uh, but then the quest went on to look for resolution. So a lot of, lot of work was done at high frequencies. And Govind Sarup was one of the persons who stressed the importance of low frequencies and built low frequency telescopes in India. And today the most uh, largest uh, telescope which is being built a square kilometer array has a very strong low frequency component. And uh, not, only, not only diffuse emission, which you want to detect uh, of energy, which is given by low energy electrons, but also material which is very far away, which may be redshifted into the low frequency part of the spectrum. So I think there's a, there would be a lot of interesting physics at the lowest frequencies, uh, which we have not been able to probe uh, because of limited by the ionosphere largely, because of limitation by the ionosphere, but I think it'll come. It won't be in my lifetime, as I said, but hopefully in your lifetimes, it'll come. Yeah, okay. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, I was wondering, like, uh, what, which kind of objects can cause lobes in multiple directions, like more than that of two, or Sorry. else only in one direction? Sorry, say it again. Uh, like, uh, I was wondering, like, which objects can cause multiple lobes, for example, three lobes or a single lobe? Or oh, in, like, in, in radio galaxies? Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, we know that generally they have two lobes, that is, and uh, they are divided into FR1 and FR2 accordingly. But okay. uh, somewhere, like, we can also see three lobes or a single lobe. In that case, what can that object be? Okay. Uh, okay, let me just elaborate that on a little bit, okay? Yeah. So maybe I'll elaborate a bit more when I talk about it, since you on active galaxies when I talk about it. For example, you see this radio galaxy over here, all right? Now, you, it has two lobes of emission on opposite sides of the nucleus, all right? Now, this is the optical galaxy, which image is shown over here, and there are beams of plasma, which is squirting out at relativistic speeds in either direction to form these extended lobes of emission. Now, these jets are also moving at relativistic speeds, all right? Now, when, you, when something is moving at a highly relativistic speed, uh, then when it is coming towards you, it will be Doppler enhanced, okay? And that is because the solid angle will change, the frequency will change, your time in the rest frame and the observed frame will be different. If you put all that in, uh, the, 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 the jets which are coming towards you uh, will be Doppler enhanced, whereas the ones which are going away from you will be Doppler diminished. Now, in the extended lobes, you normally you don't see such asymmetric structures uh, because they're they are ramming against the external medium and moving at much smaller velocities. Now, now imagine a situation where the source, and, and these effects become important when the source is inclined at a small angle. So if it is inclined at a small angle and coming towards you, and even if, the, if a lobe at that stage is moving at relativistic speeds or reasonably high velocities, you, you may be able to see a very prominent jet with a single lobe with the other lobe, which is somewhat diminished, being below your detection thresholds, okay? That could give rise to what is, uh, what is one-sided structures. The other thing is that uh, when you talk about multiple lobes, is that you see, uh, I'll talk about the you know, central engine in my second lecture, but, uh, but this is due to accretion onto a supermassive black hole. Now, now um, we, we don't completely understand what triggers the activity, 
It has something to do with uh, fuel being available, accretion onto the black hole. But it also has to do with, I think, the spin of the black hole, the properties, the spin properties of the black hole to be able to generate these kinds of uh, uh, jets, which we see. But we also see observationally evidence of a radio source switching on and switching off. Now, suppose, for example, this galaxy switched off to, and switched on, say, a million years later. Then you will see another pair of lobes from the second generation or the second, the second birth. All right. Now, and 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 sometimes it is not in the same direction because meanwhile it could be interacting with the companion, it could be disrupted, it could be processing. So you can see multiple structures or multiple lobes in a variety of situations. Uh, so Doppler boosting, uh, recurrent activity, uh, changes in axis of ejection, uh, these can give rise to uh, a, a variety of structures. In addition to that, of course, if it's in a cluster, the intercluster medium would be would affect the large scale structure as well. Okay, so maybe I'll touch a little bit more on this in the second lecture, particularly since some of you are familiar with it and are interested in it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sir, I also had one more question. Like, consider uh, I have built a telescope uh, that has that allows frequency from 14, uh, 15 megahertz to fourteen twenty five, and as we know that in that spectrum, we can get hydrogen line as well as synchrotron emission. So like, how can we classify between them? Because the difference we know for now is just that synchrotron emission is a continuous emission, whereas hydrogen line is a line emission. So like, how can we classify whether the signal okay, is let from me, let me show you this picture which I had, which I didn't go on. Okay. Now, for example, this one, this picture, okay. Hydrogen can be seen in emission as well as absorption. Okay, now what this picture shows you is the synchrotron emission over here, right? Synchrotron em emission over here. Now, in this, there's a background radio source. There's a background radio source. This is a source called 3459. And suppose they put a hydrogen cloud in front of it, all right? If I put a hydrogen cloud in front of it, then this hydrogen cloud will absorb the emission uh, from the background radio source at a particular frequency corresponding to you know, uh, at, a, at a frequency which, which will depend upon the redshift of the galaxy and the redshift of the cloud, all right? Now, the cloud could be associated with it, associated with the source itself, in which case it, it will be a redshift of the source itself. Now, you can see over here, I'm giving you absorption. I'll also mention about emission in a short while. So you can see the absorption profile over here, the, 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 the continuum line over here due to synchrotron emission. And at precisely where you expect the absorption to take place, you will see that neutral hydrogen is being absorbed over here, right? So, and similarly in emission also, when you do that, you could, you could get a continuum spectrum and where the line is, that then you can, you will see the emission line superimposed on the continuum spectrum. While doing the analysis, sometimes the lines are very weak. Uh, this one, it has stood out very clearly. It, it may not stand out so clearly. So you make, a, you make a guesstimate on how wide the line you expect, what range you expect it in, and then you take, you take line-free ch channels or line-free region of observations, and you subtract that out from the spectrum to try and bring out this, these absorption features more clearly. You may also average channels to reduce the noise, et cetera. But, but, uh, uh, but, but I mean, it is an art to, to actually uh, try and get rid of RFI. And, uh, and use and, and reduce your data in a way that you can bring out the absorption or emission lines with confidence. In, in sort of in, in spiral galaxies and all these lines are pretty strong. Uh, so they stand out quite easily. In our galaxy, for example, the neutral atomic hydrogen, if you, if you for example, just rotate the GMRT uh, in the direction of the plane of our galaxy, uh, Subhashish is going to talk about this, my colleague and friend from NCRA, that you, you just, just on the chart record or just on the uh, sort of display in the control room, you'll be able to see the emission line very clearly. But in more distant and particularly early type galaxies or hydrogen, uh, late, early type galaxies, the elliptical galaxies where hydrogen content is low, you'll have to be more careful with the data analysis. But basically, in the, the, uh, the line could be, uh, would be roughly at the uh, uh, redshift of the galaxy. Uh, if it is associated with it, but if it is in between, it could happen anywhere. So you take line-free channels of what you're confident of and subtract that out from the emission to uh, and play around the data to try and bring these features out more clearly, all right? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Okay, thank you, sir. But you learn more about this from, uh, from Subhashi, so he's actually doing an H1 experiment with you. All right? Okay, yeah, thank you, sir. Okay, maybe I can stop here because uh, my colleagues will require time to prepare for, and you also need a little bit of a break of 10 minutes before you start again, right? But sure. you, can, you can email your questions and also, you know, uh, we'll try to address them later. Yeah, you, there's one quick question, is it? Yes, sir. Is there any reason behind the why CMB is showing perfect black body radiation? Why CMB is such a perfect black body radiation? Yeah. But, yeah. Okay, it has, I mean, Tate will probably give you, uh, we'll address this question much more clearly. But the thing is that it's, it's, it's right from the epoch when the radiation decoupled and it has been continuously cooling ever since. And you see minor fluctuations, but the fluctuations due to uh, the structures which form, which the CMA interacted with, but uh, those structures, um, those interactions are very small. So it is the universe itself which has cooled, uh, uh, cooled from the time that radiation decoupled to its present epoch to, to give you this almost perfect black body radiation. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we'll stop now because uh, otherwise we'll run into uh, the next lecture. So I'll stop sharing. And uh, I think Ashish, uh, Prakash, and uh, Adesh will take over. And I will. Uh,